Since 1992, DW Fern mic preamps, equalizers, and compressors have been used in some of the world's best studios, as well as in private use and home studios around the world. This tutorial will help you get the most from your DW Fern products, learn what each control does, and see the best setup starting points for a variety of recording situations. Learn how to interface our products with the rest of your studio gear. Take a peek inside and see how our products are made and learn from Doug Fern's experience in over 40 years in pro audio. This is the VT7. It's a two channel compressor with two completely independent channels that can be used separately or linked together for stereo. It uses all class A triode vacuum tubes in the audio path. And in this video, we're going to go through what each control does, give you some suggested starting points for setting it up, and talk about compression in, in general. And some of those principles could be useful to you in, uh, in using the VT7 and in, in using other compressors as well. We'll start out talking about the controls. And the most important control on the VT7, the one you'll use most often, is a threshold control right here. You'll notice that there's another one over here for the other channel. We'll just be talking about one channel here. The threshold control adjusts the amount of gain reduction or compression on the signal. When it's all the way turned to the left counterclockwise, there is no compression, and the signal that goes into the VT7 is exactly the same as what comes out of the VT7. There is no compression at all. But as you turn the uh, threshold up, the amount of compression increases. We're now looking at the amount of compression with a meter in the gain reduction position, which measures the amount of compression. And we're using tone in this example to make it easy to illustrate it. Normally with program material, of course, you'd see that bouncing around, indicating an approximate amount of gain reduction. The actual amount of gain reduction could be quite a bit more than what's shown on the meter, because like all mechanical meters, it can't follow the extreme peaks. It's more of an averaging device which corresponds to what it sounds like to your ear rather than the peak level. So even if you have very small amounts of compression, maybe only just flickering that needle from time to time, there still may be a significant amount of compression going on on the, on the peaks. And you'll hear the difference even though the meter doesn't indicate very much. So as we turn this up, we get greater and greater amounts of compression. and when we turn it down, of course, all the way down, it's, there is no compression at all. And what are we doing in this? What we're doing is taking the highest peaks and reducing them in level. That's all a compressor or a limiter can do, is reduce the high peak level. So if we were to look at the dynamic range of a sound, and we'll say it's this wide, we'll say maybe this is 80 dB, from the peak level down here to the lowest level of the reverb or room sound dying out. And if we add 3 dB of compression to that, <clears throat> what we've done is we've brought down the peak level by 3 dB. We add 6 dB of compression, we brought the peak level down by 6 dB, and so on. So now we have a dynamic range that's, that's reduced considerably. It's perhaps half of what it was originally. The problem is now we reduce the overall level in our mix. So we need some way to push that back up to our operating level. And that's the purpose of the gain control. The, um, the gain control restores us back up and what we end up with is the exact same level we started with except all the low level signals are brought up and the overall volume of the mix is increased or the sound that you're recording. So as you can see, if we switch the meter to VU, it shows our output level, and we increase the amount of compression. Here we're showing roughly 3 dB of compression. Here we're showing roughly 3 dB of reduced output level. We use the gain control here to bring that back up so that it again indicates zero. Now, of course, you'd be doing this on program material, so the needle will be bouncing around, so you can only approximate it. Most of the time that's fine, but it's probably a good idea to take a look at the peak reading meter on your workstation, on your converter, on your recorder, whatever device you're feeding it to, to make sure the level is appropriate for the digital device. 
Analog devo devices, of course, have generally less of a restraint like that. So what we've done now is compress the signal by 3 dB and brought up the gain to compensate for that reduction in level. It's important to realize that the gain control has no effect on the amount of compression, has no effect on the input level. All it does is restore the output level after you've added compression. This column of three controls is important in adjusting the overall sound of the VT7. We'll talk about each one in detail. The top one is labeled attack. Attack means how long does it take when a signal comes along that exceeds the threshold that we've set before the VT7 applies compression to it. Now you might think that the ideal thing would be for it to respond instantaneously. And sometimes you want that. If you're mastering a CD and you want to get the maximum overall level, you need to control those peaks because there's a finite limit to how loud the signal can get in a digital realm um, before you run out of numbers and, and generate a lot of distortion. So uh, in that case, uh, a very fast attack time is, is necessary. But we're dealing with a VT7 with a device which is used in tracking and mixing. So we want to be able to uh, creatively control the amount of attack time. If you adjust the, the attack time slower, it allows the initial transient to get through relatively uncompressed. So the initial hit of a snare drum or, or the initial note of a piano um, will go through without much compression and the subsequent amount of sound after that, the rattle, the snare, the sustained note of the piano, will be compressed. And when you do that, you maintain that transient peak at the beginning, which adds a lot of the excitement and power to the music. So you don't want to eliminate those or the, the music's going to sound uh, very dull, dull and flat, um, dynamically. So the attack control ranges from a position all the way to counterclockwise of fast to slow all the way clockwise. In the slow position, the, the actual attack time is still pretty fast, um, you know, measured in milliseconds. It varies somewhat with the adjustment of the other controls. When you go all the way to the fast position, it's extremely fast and in fact so quick <clears throat> that on low frequency material, say a bass guitar, it can actually attack on each individual cycle. And when that happens, it generates distortion. This isn't a problem with a VT7, it's a fact of physics and occurs in all compressors and limiters that allow you to adjust the attack time that fast. So, extremely fast attack times are going to generate low frequency distortion. What you can do, though, is if you hear that, is just back this off a little bit. Turn it to the right just slightly until that distortion goes away. You'll still have a very fast attack time without having that distortion. What's a good starting point for the attack control? I think right around there is probably the best starting point for most material. It's um, slow enough that the transient peaks get through and maintain the energy in the mix. It's uh, slow enough that you'll never run into any low frequency distortion. And it's a good general point for most kinds of material. So start out there and then you can fine tune it from that point. The next control is labeled release. And this determines after how long after a signal has been compressed does it take for the gain to become back up to its uncompressed gain. Picture this, if you had just a track with a snare drum on it and you had a very long release time, what would happen is each hit of the snare drum would cause compression and then the amount of time it would take for the gain to be restored to normal um, would be quite long, measured in seconds. That wouldn't be appropriate for a snare drum, obviously, unless the snare hits were seconds apart. Um, so in its extreme slow position, that, that can be several seconds long. In the fast position, the time is measured in milliseconds. And like the attack, it can cause distortion on the low frequencies. So it, what will happen is it will release on each individual cycle of the bass note and create an unpleasant sound. Could be useful in some cases, but usually not. 
So you would have to back that off a little bit, just like the attack, to get rid of that distortion, unless that's what you're looking for. So where's a good point for this? For a lot of material, somewhere around this range is a good starting point for the release time. This allows the mix to be quite dense and full sounding, and yet um, doesn't have any of the artifacts that, that you might encounter with slower or faster release times. On some other kinds of material, you might want a very slow release time if your goal is not to control peaks, but just to provide an overall uh, leveling out of the, of the signal levels. But right about there is probably a good place to start. The third control in this column is a little bit more difficult to explain and label. We've labeled it with uh, a mark at one end of it called harder and at the other end called softer. And that's probably the best way to describe what this control does. In order to understand this a little better, we have to talk a little bit about some of the characteristics that determine the sound of a compressor. One of those characteristics is the ratio. And this is how much does the output level increase for a given increase in input level. So if you have a ratio of one to one, that means that the output level is exactly the same as the input level. There is no compression. If you have a ratio of 2 to 1, that means that for every 2 dB that the input level goes up, the output level goes up 1 dB. If you have a ratio of 10 to 1, for every 10 dB that the input level goes up, the output level only goes up 1 dB. That's pretty extreme, and generally speaking, compression ratios of 10 to 1 or greater are considered limiting rather than compression. The VT7 isn't a limiter. It's designed to control dynamically um, composite material or individual tracks, but not to control uh, the peak levels of things. There's other devices that would be more appropriate for that. So the ratio in the VT7 never gets above 10 to 1. 